human body starts to decompose four minutes after death. Once the encapsulation of life, it now undergoes its final metamorphosis. It begins to digest itself. Cells dissolve from the inside out. Tissue turns to liquid, then to gas. No longer animate, the body becomes an immovable feast for other organisms. Bacteria first, then insects. Flies. Eggs are laid, then hatch. The larvae feed on the nutrient-rich broth and then migrate. They leave the body in orderly fashion, following each other in a neat procession that always heads south. Southeast or southwest sometimes, but never north. No one knows why. By now, the body's muscle protein has broken down, producing a potent chemical brew. Lethal to vegetation, it kills the grass as the larvae crawl through it, forming an umbilical of death that extends back the way they came. In the right conditions, dry and hot, say, without rain, it can extend for yards, a wavering brown conga line of fat yellow grubs. It's a curious sight, and for the curious, what could be more natural than to follow this phenomenon back to its source? Which was how the Yates boys found what was left of Sally Palmer. Neil and Sam came across the maggot trail on the edge of Farnham Wood, where it borders the marsh. It was the second week of July, and already the unnatural summer seemed to have been going on forever. The heat seemed eternal, leaching the colour from the trees and baking the ground to the hardness of bone. The boys were on their way to Willow Hole, a reed pond that passed as a local swimming pool. They were meeting friends there and would spend the Sunday afternoon bombing into the tepid green water from an overhanging tree. At least, so they thought. I see them as bored and listless, drugged by the heat and impatient with each other. Neil, at 11, three years older than his brother, would be walking slightly ahead of Sam to demonstrate his impatience. There's a stick in his hand with which he whips the stalks and branches he passes. Sam trudges along behind, sniffing from time to time. Not from a summer cold, but from the hay fever that also reddens his eyes. A mild antihistamine would help him, but at this stage he doesn't know that. He always sniffs during summer. Always the shadow to his bigger brother, he walks with his head down, which is why he, and not his brother, notices the maggot trail. He stops and examines it before shouting Neil back. Neil is reluctant, but Sam has obviously found something. He tries to act unimpressed, but the undulating line of maggots intrigues him as well. The two of them crouch over the grubs, pushing dark hair out of similar faces and wrinkling their noses at the ammoniac smell. And though neither could later remember whose idea it was to see where they were coming from, I imagine it to be Neil's. Having walked past the maggots himself, he would be keen to assert his authority once more. So it's Neil who sets off first, heading towards the yellow tuft of marsh grass from which the larvae are flowing, and leaving Sam to follow. Did they notice the smell as they approached? Probably. It would be strong enough to cut through even Sam's block sinuses. And they probably knew what it was. No city boys, these. They would be familiar with the cycle of life and death. The flies, too, would have alerted them, a somnolent buzzing that seemed to fill the heat. But the body they discovered was not the sheep or deer or even dog they might have expected. Naked but unrecognisable in the sun, Sally Palmer was full of movement, a rippling infestation that boiled under her skin and erupted from mouth and nose, as well as the other, less natural openings in her body. The maggots had spilled from her pool on the ground before crawling away in the line that now stretched beyond the Yates boys. I don't suppose it matters which one broke first, but I think it would be Neil. As ever, Sam would have taken his cue from his big brother, trying to keep up in a race that led them first home, then to the police station, and then, finally, to me. As well as a mild sedative, I also gave Sam antihistamine to help his hay fever. By this time, though, he wasn't the only one to have red eyes. Neil, too, was still shaken by their discovery, although now he was beginning to recover his juvenile poise. So it was he, rather than Sam, who told me what had happened, already starting to reduce the raw memory to a more acceptable form, a story to be told and retold. And later, when the tragic events of that preternaturally hot summer had run their course, years later, Neil would be telling it still, forever identified as the one whose discovery had started it all. But it hadn't. It was just that, until then, we had never realised what was living among us. Given the right temperature, everything burns. Wood, clothing, people. 
At 250 degrees Celsius, flesh will ignite. Skin blackens and splits. The subcutaneous fat starts to liquefy, like grease in a hot pan. Fueled by it, the body starts to burn. Arms and legs, ca legs catch first, acting as kindling to the greater mass of the torso. Tendons and muscle fibers contract, causing the burning limbs to move in an obscene parody of life. Last to go are the organs. Cocooned in moistness, they often remain even after the rest of the soft tissue has been consumed. But bone is, quite literally, a different matter. Bone stubbornly resists all but the hottest fires. And even when the carbon has burned from it, leaving it as dead and lifeless as pumice, bone will still retain its shape. Now, though, it is an insubstantial ghost of its former self that will easily crumble, the final bastion of life transformed to ash. It's a process that, with few variations, follows the same inexorable pattern, yet not always. The peace of the old cottage is broken by a footfall. The rotting door is pushed open, its rusted hinges project protesting the disturbance. Daylight falls into the room, then is blocked out as a shadow fills the doorway. The man ducks his head to see into the darkened interior. The old dog with him hesitates, its senses already alerting it to what's within. Now the man too pauses, as though reluctant to cross the threshold. When the dog venture, begins to venture inside, he recalls it with a word. Here. Obediently, the dog returns, glancing nervously at the man with eyes grown opaque with cataracts. As well as the scent from inside the cottage, the animal can sense its owner's nervousness. Stay. The dog watches anxiously as the man advances further into the derelict cottage. The odour of damp envelops him, and now another smell is making itself known. Slowly, almost reluctantly, the man crosses to a low door set in the back wall. It has swung shut. He puts out his hand to push it open, then pauses again. Behind him, the dog gives a low whine. He doesn't hear it. Gently, he eases open the door, as though fearful of what he's going to see. But at first, he sees nothing. The room is dim, the only light coming from a small window whose glass is cracked and cobwebbed with, de with decades of dirt. In the mean light that bleeds through, the room retains its secrets for just a few moments longer. Then, as the man's eyes adjust, details begin to emerge, and he sees what's lying in the room. He sucks in a breath as though punched, taking an involuntary step backwards. Oh, Jesus Christ. The words are soft, but seem unnaturally loud in the still confines of the cottage. The man's face has paled. He looks around as if fearful he'll find someone there with him, but he's alone. He backs out of the doorway as if reluctant to turn away from the object on the floor. Only when the warped door has creaked shut again, cutting off his view of the other room, does he turn his back. His gait is unsteady as he goes outside. The old dog greets him, but is ignored as the man reaches inside his coat and fumbles out a pack of cigarettes. His hands are trembling, and it takes three attempts for him to ignite the lighter. He draws the smoke deep into his lungs, a nub of glowing ash chasing the paper back towards the filter. By the time the cigarette is finished, his trembling has steadied. He drops the stub onto the grass and treads it out, before bending to retrieve it. Then, slipping it into his coat pocket, he takes a deep breath and goes to make the phone call. I was on my way to Glasgow Airport when the call came. It was a foul February morning, brooding grey skies and a depressing mizzle driven by cold winds. The East Coast was being lashed by storms, and although they hadn't worked their way this far inland yet, it didn't look promising. I only hoped the worst would hold off long enough for me to catch my flight. I was on my way back to London, having spent the previous week first recovering, then examining a body from a moorland grave out on the Grampian Highlands. It had been a thankless task. The crystalline frost had turned the moors and peaks to iron, as breathtakingly cold as it was beautiful. The mutilated victim had been a young woman, who still hadn't been identified. It was the second such body I'd been asked to recover from the Grampians in recent months. As yet, it had been kept out of the press but no one on the investigating team was in any doubt that it was the same killer. One who would kill again if he wasn't caught, and at the moment, that wasn't looking likely. What made it worse was that, although the state of decomposition made it hard to be sure, I was convinced that the mutilations weren't post-mortem. So, all in all, it had been a gruelling trip, and I was looking forward to going home. For the past 18 months, I've been living in London, 
based at the Forensic Science Department of a university. It was a temporary contract that gave me access to lab facilities until I found something more permanent. But in recent weeks, I'd spent far more time working out in the field than I had in my office. I promised Jenny, my girlfriend, that we'd been able to spend some time together after this. It wasn't the first time I'd have made this promise, but this time I was determined to keep it. Skin. The largest human organ, it is also the most overlooked. Accounting for an eighth of the entire body mass, on an average adult, it covers an area of approximately two square meters. Structurally, skin is a work of art, a nest of capillaries, glands, and nerves that both regulates and protects. It is our sensory interface with the outside world, the barrier at which our individuality, our self, ends. And even in death, something of that individuality remains. When the body dies, the enzymes that life has held in check run amok. They devour cell walls, causing the liquid contents to escape. The fluid rises to the surface, gathering below the dermal layers and causing them to loosen. Skin and body, until now two integral parts of the whole, begin to separate. Blisters form. Whole swathes begin to slip, sloughing off the body like an unwanted coat on a summer's day. But, even dead and discarded, skin retains traces of its former self. Even now it can still have a story to tell, and secrets to keep, provided you know how to look. Earl Bateman lay on his back, face turned to the sun. Overhead, birds wheeled in the blue Tennessee sky, cloudless but for the slowly dispersing vapour trail of a jet. Earl had always enjoyed the sun, enjoyed the sting of it on his skin after a long day's fishing, enjoyed the way its brightness lent a new look to whatever it touched. There was no shortage of sun in Tennessee, but Earl came originally from Chicago, and the cold winters there had left a permanent chill in his bones. When he moved to Memphis back in the 70s, he'd found the swampy humidity far more to his liking than the windy streets of his home city. Of course, as a dentist in a small practice, with a young wife and two small children to keep, he didn't spend as much time out in it as he might have liked. But it was there all the same. He even liked the sweltering heat of Tennessee in summers, when the breeze would feel like a hot flannel, and the evenings were spent in the airless swelter of the cramped apartment he and Kate shared with the boys. Things had changed since then. The dental practice had flourished, and the apartment had long since given way to bigger and better things. Two years before, he and Kate had moved into a new five-bedroomed house in a good neighbourhood, with a wide, rich green lawn where the growing brood of grandchildren could safely play, and the early morning sunshine would shatter into miniature rainbows in the fine spray from the water sprinkler. It had been on the lawn, sweating and cursing as he'd struggled to soften a dead branch from the big old laburnum, that he'd had the heart attack. He'd left the saw still trapped in the tree limb and managed to take a few faltering steps towards the house before the pain had felled him. In the ambulance, with an oxygen mask strapped over his face, he had held tightly onto Kate's hand and tried to smile to reassure her. At the hospital, there had been the usual urgent ballet of medical staff, the frantic unsheathing of needles and beeping of machines. It had been a relief when they'd eventually fallen silent. A short time later, after the necessary forms had been signed, the inevitable bureaucracy that accompanies each of us from birth, Earl had been released. Now he was stretched out in the spring sun. He was naked, laying on a low wooden frame that was raised off the carpet of meadow grass and leaves. He'd been here for over a week, long enough for the flesh to have melted away, exposing bone and cartilage under the mummified skin. Wisps of hair still clung to the back of his skull, from which empty eye sockets gazed at the cerulean blue sky. I finished taking measurements and stepped out of the wire mesh cage that protected the dentist's body from birds and rodents. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. It was late afternoon and hot, despite the early season. Spring was taking its time this year, the buds swollen and heavy. In a week or two's time, the display would be spectacular, but for now, the birch and maples of the Tennessee woodland still hugged their new growth to them, as though reluctant to let go. The hillside I was on was unremarkable enough, scenic almost, though less dramatic than the imposing ridges of the Smoky Mountains that rose up in the distance. But it was an altogether different aspect of nature that struck everyone who visited here. Human bodies in various stages of decay lay all around. In the undergrowth, out in the full sun and lying in the shade. The more recent still bloated with decompositional gases. The older ones desiccated to leather. 
Some were hidden from view, buried underground or in car boots. Others, like the one I'd been weighing, were covered by mesh or chain link streams, screens, laid out like exhibits in some grisly art installation. Except that the purpose of this place was far more serious and far less public. I put my equipment and notepad back into my bag and straightened. Leaving the dentist to his slow decay, I skirted a body that lay partially hidden by shrubs, this one darkened and, sw and swollen, and followed the narrow dirt trail that meandered down through the trees. A young black woman in grey surgical smock and trousers was crouching by a half-hidden cadaver that was resting in the shade of a fallen tree trunk. She was using tweezers to pick squirming larvae from it, dropping each one into a separate screw-top jar. Hi, Alana, I said. She looked up and gave me a smile, tweezers poised. Hey, David. Is Tom around? Last time I saw him, he was down by the pads. And watch where you step, she called after me. There's a district attorney in the grass down there. I raised my hand in acknowledgement as I carried on down the trail. It ran parallel to a high chain link fence that surrounded the two acres of woodland. The chain link was topped with razor wire and screened by a second fence, this one made from timber. A large gate was the only way in or out, on which was hung a painted sign. In plain black letters were the words Anthropology Research Facility, but it was better known by another, less formal name. Most people just called it the body farm. It was something I'd always been interested in. Um, in my first degree course, it was part of the actual, I did an English degree and it was part of the English degree to do an element of creative writing. But after I'd finished, I found I got nothing to write about once I finished the course. Um, so for a few years I didn't, I stopped writing altogether until I went to Spain uh, to teach English as a foreign language. And I did the real Ernest Hemingway thing and took a, it was actually a manual typewriter at the time and took that over with me and began writing there because um, it's a, a compulsion, I suppose, you have, more than an obsession, but you just feel there's something you need to do and you're not entirely happy unless you're, unless you're writing. I mentioned Ernest Hemingway earlier um, and his, some of his work and his short stories in particular when I was in my 20s very much influenced me. Um, I very much admired the simplicity of style and the fact that he could communicate so much in such apparently simple and basic language. Um, I tried doing it myself, couldn't, so it obviously wasn't as, as, uh, as easy as he made it look. So there was Hemingway and I suppose my other formative um, influence was Raymond Chandler, the American crime writer of the 30s and 40s who created Philip Marlowe. And I tore through the, uh, the, the, the Philip Marlowe novels and they made, they made a big impression on me. So I suppose those two really, one way or another, were, were two of my main influences. Um, I've been here a few times now. My wife and I actually came over for a, a break last year, and it was the first time either of us had been, um, and we very much enjoyed it. So it's a lovely city. I love cities that have got water. Sheffield, the city I'm from, has got a, got a, a large river and canal running through it, um, but it has to be said it's not quite as impressive as Hamburg's. So it's just a, a great city. It's vibrant, and like my own city of Sheffield, it's got the, uh, the industrial heritage as well, which I also like.